So we get started here with the batch system that we looked at last time. And we derive this stoichiometric table for the batch system. So let's just quickly recall what that means. Here's a batch system over here. It's a great picture from Argo National Laboratory. Their batch system here is extremely complex. Multiple devices and modes one gets to measure the right as it progresses. What the company does is they put a certain amount of material in that batch, in A naught, in B naught, in C naught. There's a certain change over time, and at the end there's a certain number of things remaining. So we derive that table from the previous class. And then we also derive from the previous class what the concentrations are, C A, C B, C C, etc., if we assume constant volume. Let's take that assumption away. So, does a batch reactor ever have a situation where you have the volume changing? Which is a batch reactor where the volume changes? No, a single, we're looking at a single batch reactor. Can we ever have a case where the volume, for example, in this reactor, does the volume change? So why would you write the case where the volume changes? <laughs> so there will be situations where the volume may decrease slightly for liquid systems. For gas phase systems, the volume stays fixed. Right? The volume occupies the full space of the reactor. For most reactors. Two important examples where the volume of the batch reactor changes is your car's combustion engine. As the combustion occurs, that cylinder gets expanded out. And so that's a batch reaction occurring, and the volume is changing as the conversion progresses. Another one is the, cylind the, the cylinder of a rifle or a gun as it's being shot. As the reaction is changing, the vessel size of volume is being expanded. So there are those two cases. and. We, the reason why I'm looking at this perspective is because what we're going to do in a minute is to derive the same for a flow system, which is a pretty similar structure. So let's begin with uh, the simplest laws, PV equals Z. So we've got our ideal gas flow, but Z is our compressibility factor. So are we dividing for what um, the change in volume can be by the other? So, we have the ideal gas flow, P equals ZNRT, where those terms will have their usual meaning. At the time zero, we have the case, we have R modes, D modes, equals Z modes, the initial number of modes at time zero. R is constant and T modes. So everything just gets its own subscript. I can find the ratio of V over V naught, or simply I can write V V naught V naught over P T over T naught Z over Z naught and N T shows me what my volume of my batch is going to be relative to my starting point. So T0, P0, Z0, these are my starting conditions. If my temperature goes up, my volume goes up. So as the gas expands, the volume will expand relative to the starting point. If the pressure decreases, the volume will go up as well. So all of these make intuitive sense to us. What we can do is we can recall from last time we have this equation up here on the slides, nt is equal to nt naught. And we gave a, a shorter term for this ratio <coughs> of the stoichiometric coefficients. We call that delta. So nt is nt naught plus delta na naught times the conversion. What I'm going to try and do here is simplify and take away at least one of these brackets. If I divide both sides by nt0, I 
I get this relationship that nt over nt naught is equal to 1 plus delta times <coughs> na naught over nt naught, I can simplify a little bit. I can call that ya subscript 0 times x. The reason for that is ya0 is the mole fraction of a at the initial conditions. Another simplification I'm going to make is I'm going to call this term over here delta times the mole fraction. I'm going to introduce a new, a new symbol for that. We're going to call that epsilon. for batch systems, <coughs> we have nt over nt is equal to 1 plus epsilon x. We're going to see this term 1 plus epsilon x reoccur multiple times. system that does not obey the ideal gas law, we, we summarize that non-ideality by this factor z. Well, that z at the beginning of the batch is probably going to be pretty much the same as the z at the end of the batch. So we make that simplified assumption as well. So this shows me how the volume of my batch is going to change as conversion goes. Let's take a look for a system where the number of moles decreases over time. So what we mean by that was... Let's take the ammonia system. <coughs> so I've got one mole of nitrogen, three moles of hydrogen going to two moles of ammonia. So the total number of moles decreases over time as the batch progresses, as the reaction progresses. So delta in that case is equal to 2 over 1 minus 3 over 1 minus 1. So 2 minus 3 minus 1 minus 2. So delta is minus 2 for that situation. That implies that epsilon is negative. Epsilon is delta times the mole fraction. Okay, so we call this ratio delta. Delta is simply the ratio of the mole fractions, sorry, of the, mole, the, the stoichiometric coefficients, I should say. So 2 over 1 for my product, minus 3 over 1 for hydrogen, minus 1 for my nitrogen. So delta is a negative number, epsilon is a negative number. So this shows me that as this reaction progresses, x gets larger and larger. As I get higher and higher conversion, the total batch volume is going to shrink. So epsilon is negative. As we get greater conversion, our volume in the system is going to shrink and reduce. If we were, if we were doing this reaction in a variable volume batch reactor. Let's recognize, obviously, that most of our batches do not have the changing in volume over time. So for most systems, V is equal to V. <coughs> but this equation is still pretty powerful because it's now telling me I can rearrange the pressure. 
So if my volume is constant, it's my pressure that's going to be changing. In a closed system, pressure will be varying. So I can rearrange that for P, the total pressure is equal to the initial pressure, P naught, 1 plus epsilon times the conversion multiplied by temperature of the T. Okay, so this is probably the most important equation for a batch system. Let's emphasize that this is for a batch. <coughs> so it's telling me how my pressure will change at any point along the reaction, from zero conversion, x is equal to zero, up to final conversion, capital X, I can predict what my pressure in that closed reactor is going to be. This is a critical equation, important to, to, to understand. Okay, everyone clear, clear on the derivation? Relatively clear? It is in the textbook as well. If you didn't quite get all the details down, uh, please follow in the textbook. But the, the main assumptions are we started with the batch system, we assume that the volume is changing, we recognize that most systems do not have a constant, uh, have, do not have a change in volume, so that allows us to set B as equal to B0. We also assume back there that Z is equal to Z, which is also true for most of the systems. So under those two simplifying assumptions, we get a fairly um, compact equation. Let's take a look now at flow systems. So this was for batch. Let's go back to flow systems. So this is where the handout in front of you now is going to be useful. So in the previous class, we, on your previous table, we derived this flow flow system. We had columns one, two, three, and four. And I said that this table applies under all situations. Even in the situations where the volume is changing, the pressure is changing, where the temperature is changing, there is nothing in this table that is a simplification. You can always use this stoichiometric table, columns one, two, three, and four. The problem comes is we like to work with concentrations and conversions. So what we did is in the last class, we added a fifth column for concentration. And ignore all this mess over here on the last two thirds of the slide, but this first column over here was what we derived. We said that the concentration is equal to flow, as the molar flow divided by the inlet flow rate, V, or Q, as it's sometimes called. So FA divided by V, or FA divided by Q, depending on the preference. And we derived these equations here for concentrations for A, B, C, E, and for the notes. Let me uh, just quickly point out some additional notation that we're going to start to use now. So if I take that molar flow A, FA, it's FA naught coming into my flow reactor minus A over A is 1 times the conversion x. So that's, that's standard from the slides. We derive also, and this is in the, in the, in the page in front of you, FB is FA naught, B to B, minus B over A, FC is FA naught B to C plus the ratio C over A, B over A. So let's write some gen general, general equations because we're not always going to write our equation four times for A, B, C, and D. Sometimes we just like to write our equation once and we're going to call it FJ. So FJ is flow leaving is equal to the flow in of A, FA naught, times theta J, and unfortunately, Fogler is screwing up yet again and introducing a third V that looks extremely similar, and this time it's the Greek V, which we call mu. So please, this is, I don't have no idea why he used this ridiculous notation. We now have three Vs available to us. We have capital V, the volume. We have lowercase V, the molar flow, and then we have Greek V, the stoichiometric ratio. So it's not my choice of notation. So, let's pay attention here. It simply says FA0, that's common to all those four terms there, the theta value, theta j, theta j is clearly equal to 1 for our basis. So A is my basis, 
theta j is going to be 1. Recall what theta j is. Theta is equal to the ratio. Let me just make a ratio code. I always flip them around. Theta j is nj naught divided by na naught. So it's clear then that theta a is equal to na naught over a naught. So in general, theta j, you can add this, to, add this to your notes. Theta j is nj naught divided by nj So these thetas refer to the flows NA. So theta B, for example, refers to, to the flow of B divided by the flow of A. divided by the volume, so that's what CT is, total moles per meter cubed. And that's related to the ideal gas flow. P is equal to Z of RT. But CT, the total moles flowing into my reactor, is also equal to FT over the flow of V. Or sometimes, as you, when I write on the board, I exchange V and 
But it, since we're referring to the nodes in front of you, we're using the notation that's, that's there. Okay, so let's, uh, I, I see a few confused faces. Let's just draw a picture to make sure we're all 100% clear on what, what we're doing and what we mean by which there is. So this may be helpful to add to the bottom of that page 115. It's just a diagram that's showing what's going on here. It's my flow reactor. This is either a PFR or a CSTR. And at the outlet, we've got some concentration CT. We've got flow OV. We've got my total flow FT, that's in moles per second. V is equal to V is Q per second. CT is <coughs> moles per meter cube. So if you look at those ratios, of the units, it's clear there that CT, the total concentration of the moles flowing out, is equal to FT moles per second divided by meters per second. So you get moles per meter. So that's at the outlet. The image of my reactor, I have CT zero, the number of moles per meter coming in. I also have V zero meters cubed per second. And I have Ft0 moles per second. Okay, so that's the notation you should have in mind. So given this relationship from the ideal gas law, Ct is equal to P over ZRT, I can equate those two. I've got two equations now for Ct. Let's equate them, and we can then write what's up here. And this is in your notes, in front of you, page 116. So go to the page. Right at the top of that page, here's the that equation. Ct is equal to Ft over V. So at the outlet, Ct is Ft over V, but it's also equal to the ideal gas. That applies actually anywhere in the reactor. At any point in the reactor, let's take an arbitrary point over here, I can go and measure my pressure, my temperature. I know my ideal gas constant, R. I know what Z is. I can go measure the molar flow, I can go measure V, and I can go calculate CT. So that first, that equation at the right top of the page, 414, applies anywhere along the reactor. One specific point you can go apply it to is obviously right at the entrance. And then let's just add subscript zeros to everything. And I take the ratio of those two equations. And if I do that, I get the equation that's 416 on the page in front of you. Probably the most important equation in the notes in tonight's class. This is telling me what is my flow, to emphasize this important metric. What is my volumetric flow at any point in the reactor? This is, usually we take this right at the exit. But I could, as I just mentioned, pick any point in my reactor and take my corresponding values and calculate what that flow is. So you can probably see where we're heading here. We've got, let's just go back here to this general table we had. I'm looking at finding this equation on the right hand side. Let's start with what we derived last class. We said the concentration is equal to the molar flow divided by the volumetric flow. I now have an equation for the numerator, Fa, the molar flow, like this guy over here. And now I've just derived an equation for the volumetric flow, B. That's this equation. So it's where that big mess comes from is just taking the ratio of those two equations, F over V. But before we do that, let's just stop for a minute and think what this equation is actually telling us. This equation is finding for me what is the molar, sorry, what is the volumetric flow leaving my system, my PFR or my CSTR. 
given the ratio of all these variables. So consider the case where ft is ft naught. In other words, that ratio is one. That's saying the number of moles per second leaving my reactor is equal to the same as the number of moles entering my reactor per unit time. So ft naught is equal to ft. Under which conditions does that hold? When might that be true? When we have reactions that don't zero. For a reaction when delta is zero. Okay, so only when, only true when delta is zero. And there are many reactions where that is the case. The water gas shift reaction is one example of that. So the number of moles on the left hand side of my reaction equals the number of moles created on the right hand side. Those are situations when Ft is equal to Ft0. One other way you can see that is if you go back to that molar flow table in front of you, is let's take a look at that denominator down here. Sorry, the, the, the total line. Ft is equal to Ft0. Well, that's true when delta is equal to 0. So if when delta is equal to 0, Ft is Ft0. It's also obviously true right at the entrance to the reactor, because then Ft is Ft0. So, that's one situation when Ft is Ft0 and that ratio reduces to 1, which cuts out that whole term for me. If I assume the reactor is behaving isothermal, <coughs> or I don't have to assume it. If the, if the reactor actually is isothermal, then T0 is equal to T. So I can cross that term out or ignore it. And when can I assume P0 is equal to P? Isobaric. Also, in reactors where there's no pressure drop from the beginning to the end. So packed beds usually have a pressure drop as you go through the reactor. And this is where we're going to go to in the two or three classes from now. We're going to consider if this is a packed bed and there's a pressure drop from beginning to end. So here P0 at my entrance is not equal to P at the exit. So for the case where we've got to be really simplified, and these are the cases we've been looking at in all the classes prior to tonight's, we've considered the case where the system is isobaric or no pressure drop. We've considered only isothermal reactors. We've considered only so far reactors where that total flow is about, is about the same. For those situations, V is equal to V naught. So those are the situations when the meters cubed per second coming in is equal to meters cubed per second leaving. Hopefully you can see now for the vast majority of systems, that is something that never holds. But this equation tells me how to find what V is, given V0 and these other variables. <coughs> how can you have an isobaric system if you're having a flow? Do you need a pressure difference or flow temperature? Obviously, absolutely right. But we're talking minor. I mean, you can get a you can get flow with like a couple of pascals. So um, pressure drop across a closed door for you to feel air moving out the room. You only need, when I've estimated it and used it in industry, about 15 pascals. So that 15 pascals relative to one atmosphere, pretty much P is equal to P naught. There's another one. That was a question. Okay, so so good 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 observation. There. In general, though, and with very little numerical error up to now, we've assumed V is equal to V naught. Tonight's class is showing how to relax that. So let's go then to the next step and actually sub in into that concentration that we're our ultimate goal is. Okay. Like I said, we're, we're aiming to derive Cj, which is Fj divided by V in Volgo's notation. We now know what Fj is and we know what V is. And that's, that's here on the next, next slide. There is one important step in between. We need to derive an, an epsilon for this system. So this is on page 116, 117 as well. And it's in fact near the bottom of the page, equation 497. We're going to want to try and summarize Ft over Ft mod. So what I mean by that is we've got this term over here, Ft over Ft mod. Can we simplify that? That's that's 
easily done in the same way we just did for the batch reactor. We recognize that at my exit, Ft is equal to Ft naught plus <coughs> Fa naught delta x. That's from the flow table we had before. Divide through by Ft naught on the left and right hand side, and I can reduce that equation down to 1 plus F naught x. So Ft over Ft naught is 1 plus F naught x, where epsilon is equal to delta times for the mole fraction, yA naught. Okay, so let's go back to this equation for the volumetric flow is equal to V naught. I can now sub in there for Ft over Ft naught, I sub in 1 plus epsilon x. So all those 1 plus epsilon x's that you see in the table uh, from the previous class, that's where that, where that term comes from, is by making this substitution. Okay, then we can get to the next page, which is page 118. So if you go through formula, this is a phenomenally intimidating derivation the first time. My point of going through the textbook handout here with you is to show you that actually it's not that hard. We're simply bringing in concepts from chemistry, which we're comfortable with, and summing in mathematical derivations to get to a simplified state with the end. The process of getting there is always messy. So let's come back here. Cj is Fj over D. The concentration leaving my reactor is the flow leaving divided by the volumetric flow. So summing our definition for the numerator, summing for the denominator, and we get this equation over here. This equation applies in general now for any system. So it applies for systems which are not isobaric, but not isobaric, and for systems where the number of moles are left and right inside the chain. Just one more change we have to make, and then we'll get to that table that you see on page 118 in front of you. That final change is FA naught divided by V naught. We recognize that that is equal to C naught. So there, there we go. So that's the final expression for any concentration at any point in the reactor. Please use this definition directly without deriving it every time. This, uh, this one is no need to derive this. You just simply use it as it is. Because every question I will will be different situation. So you must show that you understand the situation. This one is this is such a long complicated derivation that there's no no need to derive this every time. So if we use that CJ, the concentration leaving is equal to the Okay, so let's uh, let's take an example. We have to try to use this. This is an example that we can try to follow. And I'd like you to, to work through it for, for a little bit and we'll, we'll continue on. We're saying we're going to take a mixture of SO2 and air, and we're going to combine them in a, a reactor. So here's SO2 and here's air coming in. So that air consists of nitrogen and oxygen. The part that's reacting is obviously SO2 with the oxygen. So 2SO2 plus an oxygen molecule coming from SO3. And leaving there, we're going to have SO2, we're going to have oxygen, we're going to have SO3, and we're going to have this inert species nitrogen. <laughs> this is all taking place at the entrance here. We have T naught is 500 Kelvin, and we have my initial pressure is to 1485 kPa. We'll make two simplifying assumptions for now. We're going to say this reaction takes place isothermally and no pressure drop. We're asking here to find the outlet concentrations of all these four species as a function of conversion only. Now, this is the first time we're looking at this type of problem. 
I printed out there on the page we have for the handout in front of you, this table. This is the outline I would like you to follow when you solve any reactor design problem. The first step is to write down the relation. So we have an actually in, in the material that's given to us. But let's write it down in the form that we're comfortable with using, which is A, B, C, and D. And, so. and to do so requires picking a basis. So I've chosen SO2 as my basis. But I could have also chosen oxygen as my basis. But for now, let's pick SO2, and we'll use that as A. Divide through then so we get a, a, a unity in front of A, so that half B acts reversibly and gives me one mole of C. So that's step two, two in your handout. So you're probably be best off filling out this table in front of you. So step one is to write down the reaction as is, and your basis, you state your basis. My basis is SO2, which is equal to A. symbolically. Only right at the end can we sub in the values we know. So for now, fill in that table completely symbolically with the initial number of moles of A, B, C, and nitrogen. And you can also fill out the second, the third the column for change, and then update the column for leaving. So to do that, so, uh, go back to the table that I handed out previously. Remember, this is a flow system, so we've got flow rates entering and leaving. systems where we've got recycle or this is going to be the second reactor and we've got an upstream reactor where there actually is already SO3 coming in. So let's leave that symbolically for now. What are the change in, in those? Again, you can follow that table that you had in front of you from the previous class and write that minus FA0 times X. The number of moles of, of oxygen that change is equal to minus FA naught X divided by 2. FC is equal to FA naught times X. And the change in the units is 0. leaving the reactor. So it's the sum of the initial plus the change, so we can write that as FA0, 1 minus X. For the B, leaving the reactor, we can write that using the theta notation we've just refused. So FA0, theta B, minus a half times X. And the number of moles leaving of C is 
f a naught theta c plus x. And the number of holes in them for the inverse is f a naught theta i. So this is a direct, we can simply use the table that we had from the previous classes and write that out right across. Okay, so what I mean by that is, let's just go back to the table from the previous class. It's this table over here. And so I've done nothing more than just retranscribe this table over, but I've just substituted in the lowercase abcs and these. So this first three columns, first four columns, really should take you no time to do to get those flows. Okay, it's a simple copy of the from this table subbing in the correct lowercase letters. The messier part is now what's next. And that's not too messy. We want the, the final column is the concentrations. Remember, the objective was to get the concentrations in terms of conversions. So again here I said we can simply use this table. And we can go right across to the right hand side of that table and, and simply copy over the appropriate lines. Let's recognize, and you would write this in your solution here, using the isothermal assumption T is equal to T naught and using constant pressure P is equal to P naught. So you add that to your solution. That allows you when you're copying this over into the table to simply ignore those terms T naught over T and P over P naught. So your concentrations then actually simplify fairly, fairly nicely to C A naught. 1 minus x, 1 plus epsilon x. And for b, c, a naught, theta b, <coughs> minus 1 half x. For c, it's c, a naught, Theta C plus X, 1 plus epsilon X in the denominator. And then for your inverts, it's C A naught times theta, theta I divided by 1 plus epsilon X. So this 1 plus epsilon X reoccurs everywhere. So we're going to zoom first to. If the question says so, we're, uh, from next class, we're going to start relaxing the constant pressure assumption. We're going to assume pressure drop. Okay, so chapter 5 in the textbook, we're going to consider pressure drop. Chapter 6 or 7, I think it is, we're going to consider temperature change. So for now, we're still isothermal and still constant pressure. But we are recognizing that there's a change in the number of moles, and that's why it's denominator 1 plus epsilon x. Okay, so we pretty much addressed what the question is looking for somewhat. The question was to find the concentrations leaving in terms of only conversion. We've got a few issues here though. We've got a number of variables that we don't have quantified. So we've got CA norms. We have F sorts. We have theta I, theta C, and theta B. So apart from those variables in red that we need to find numeric values for, we've actually solved the problem. So the rest of the problem then comes down to steps four, five, and then finally you'll end up with step six. So step four says, let's substitute in what we know. And let's derive other constants that we can find. So what I'll do is just to help you do that, and I'll leave you to do step four and five on your own, it's really not hard, but let's just do a quick little chemistry recap to help you with that. Here's some important notes that you can take down. I will post these slides on the website right now as I go back to my office. 
But let's just step through this. This is obvious stuff that we really know from the chemistry course. Mole fraction of A is YA. So that's the number between 0 and 1. P subscript A, this is lowercase p, is the partial pressure of A. Capital P is the total pressure in the system. So let me take those three symbols as the definition. PA can be written as the partial pressure as the total pressure times the mole fraction. So we, that one's clear to us. And that applies anywhere in my reactor. Particularly at the beginning of my reactor, I could write PA0 is equal to YA0 multiplied by P0. So that's simply at the beginning of my reactor. A few classes back, and in the assignment, we used this assumption, not to this assumption, we used this equation from the ideal gas law that the partial pressure of A actually is equal to the concentration of A times RT. So now we've got two equations for partial pressure one in terms of mole fraction and one in terms of concentration. Let's equate those two YAP is equal to CART. And what's really helpful is to rearrange for CA. And you're going to understand why I've done this. I've rearranged for CA. That's now the partial pressure, uh, YA times the total pressure. In other words, that's the partial pressure as well, YAP. So it's the mole fraction multiplied by the total pressure divided by the gas constant, R and T. Also, I can write that same equation at the reactor entrance. CA0 so is YA0 times P0 over RT. This is not in Fogler. Fogler assumes you know this, but let's just, uh, let's just, uh, you can download it off the website later tonight and add this to your notes. The reason why I've done this is obvious because we've got all these CA0s that we need to find. Okay, so that's how we get CA0. CA0 is equal to the mole fraction of A multiplied by the total pressure divided by R <coughs> entry temperature. We know the entry temperature, 500 Kelvin. We know the entry pressure, 1485. The only thing we don't know in there is why A0, the mole fraction of A. Do we or don't we know? So up here is actually given to us a mixture of 28% SO2. There's your mole fraction of A. To it. Okay, so you've got everything now actually to calculate CA0. So what I'd like you to do to, uh, well, before the class tomorrow, I know that this class is a long and dry derivation. It's messy. We're getting a lot of new symbols. Please go through these four pages, five pages in the handout in front of you again. They are critical. Every single class from now on is going to build up on this. 